Hey, and welcome to this video in which I fulfill a fantasy that I've always had. One of the iconic boxes, the voodoo cards with the eyes. And I've chosen this one. I wasn't going to buy them all because that would have cost an awful lot of money. I got this, the Voodoo 3 3500, because I didn't have one. And now I've got one and it's in one of those boxes. So what lurks inside? Another couple of smaller boxes. So we'll get those out and put the gleaming blue eyes to one side for the minute and see what we've got. Straight away, there's a couple of things missing in here. There would have been a manual. There would have been a, a driver disc. There would have been a free game and a couple of special offers. Haven't got those, unfortunately. But the card is in there and the other bit which could cause problems when you buy these cards is this this thumping big blue purpley dongle thing and there's a little bit of literature in there though not the actual user manual which is a bit of a shame also a little baggy with a couple of aerial adapters for the old analog tv cables but yeah this thing look at it just look at it it's uh it's a thick cable i would worry about that hanging off the back of a graphics card it weighs a ton it almost needs a specialist sort of force of men to deal with it so this thing despite adding lots of connectivity it's got a pass-through cable this is like you know it's a bit of a hark back to the the voodoo one and the voodoo two that this card expects you to use this thing as a pass-through for your vga cable so the the connector on the card which we'll look at in a minute is not what you'd normally expect at the other end of it we've got this we've got a set of ins on one side and a set of outs on the other so we've basically got we've got our composite connectors and an s-video connector i could have chosen to compare this with the current crop of competition that it would have been up against in 1999 so that would have been primarily the tnt2 and the rage 128 to a lesser degree, the Savage 4 and the Matrox G400. But we're not going to do that. We're going to compare it with its younger sibling, the Voodoo 3 3000, which came out, I think, in April 1999, as opposed to July 1999 for the 3500. The 3500 has an advantage on paper over the 3000 in that the 3000's clocks on both memory and core are 166 megahertz, and that was up to 183 for the 3500. Apart from that, the spec's pretty much identical, though obviously the bandwidth and the fill rates and things like that are going to be slightly higher on the 3500. So by the time the 3500 appeared, which was a good four or five months after the other Voodoo 3 cards. The companies like NVIDIA and ATI had already said that their next gen stuff was going to be out by the end of the year and unfortunately for the Voodoo 3 3500 they, they were going to be in direct competition with things like the GeForce 256 which literally came out a couple of months later so that was a complete sort of game changer in the graphics world and it partly explains why 3DFX kind of shot themselves in the foot and were were just put bringing out old tech when everybody else was moving on and that was kind of the end so this was possibly the card at the very pinnacle of 3dfx's fame and everything was downhill after this basically so looking at the 3500 card we've got a very big tv tuner analog tv tuner the days of those broadcasts have long gone nobody has these on their roofs anymore so that's a bit of a shame we're probably not going to get to uh to mess around with that TV output. The config of the card slightly different in that some of the memory was mounted on the back because we've got all of the other odds and ends to do with the video in and out and the TV tuner taking up a lot of the room, which we don't have on the Voodoo 3 3000. Has to be said, the heatsink on the 3500 is a bit nicer than this big ugly thing that was always on the Voodoo 3. The Avenger chip of course ran very hot as well um, but it does look like they just went into a warehouse of industrial heat sinks and picked one off the shelf. It's not the nicest looking thing. It has to be said that the purple heat sink it doesn't really look very purple in the video but it is a very deep purple. Uh, it gives it a certain air of regality so maybe they kind of knew that this was going to be the last and possibly the king of the 3dfx cards as the brand kind of went downhill after that with the 
4500 and the 5500 but yes for a small time this would have been the king of 3dfx at its prime probably i mentioned earlier there was some paperwork in the box nothing terribly exciting this declaration de conformité basically legal shenanigans about the health and safety aspects of things which isn't very interesting nice to have some paperwork but would have preferred the manual and then there's this other little bit of paper which has some interesting facts that i didn't know about before basically it's explaining that if you were in north america the voodoo 33500 also had a fm am radio tuner built into it we poor beggars in Europe didn't get that, unfortunately. So just in case you'd read any magazine reviews and given you that impression, there was this little slip of paper put in there to say, tough, no radio for you, Europe. Anyway, enough about the card itself. It's in the machine now. This is my test rig, which I use to do all my benchmarking and stuff on. I try and keep this machine as level a playing field as possible to do comparisons on. Some of you may have seen it before. A quick look in Everest Home Edition, you can see the spec. So basically it's an Athlon Thunderbird 1300 with 512 megs of RAM and running Windows 98. Well, that's enough of looking at the cards. Now let's see what it's like to use. So we're going to do some benchmarking. We're going to be using 3D Mark 99, 3D Mark 2000, Unreal Tournament, MDK2 and Expendable to do a quick bench. We're going to be doing it at 800 by 600, 1024 by 768 and 1280 by 1024 of course these are voodoo cards so it's all 16-bit and then after that we're gonna have a little bit of a play around with that dongle and all of those tv inputs and outputs so first in at the gate we've got 3d mark 99 results and that's kind of what you would expect the slight bump in clocks on the 3500 gives it an edge over the voodoo 3 3000 in all of the tests uh, not quite as much as maybe I was thinking it would be, but kind of ballpark. You're expecting maybe a few extra frames for your money with this card. 3D Mark 2000 was a bit of a surprise. That was really close. There was really not much in it at all. The the 3500 was slightly ahead in all of the tests. Uh, you don't really see it very well on the graph, but you're kind of looking at, at 1024 by 768. It was 3274 for the 3000 and 3553 for the 3500 so it was a little bit faster but I was expecting that to be a little bit more comprehensive. On to Unreal Tournament so the other benchmarks were synthetic and therefore probably not very accurate. Here we're using Glide so we give both cards the best chance they can possibly do to perform and yeah again Maybe not quite as much as I was expecting, but it does widen a little bit as the resolutions go up. So just a few frames at 800 by 600, but then you're probably up to five or six frames by 1280 by 1024, which isn't a lot when you consider that at the point the Voodoo 33500 came out in 1999, you could pick up a Voodoo 33000 for around $170, I think, but the cost of the 3500 was well over 200 going up to 250 I think, so you probably weren't really getting your bang for your buck for gaming, at least. MTK2 is kind of the opposite of that, so we start off with quite an advantage for the 3500. 800 by 600, you're kind of 15, 16 frames ahead of the Voodoo 3 3000. But the gap narrows as you go up the resolutions till when you get to 1280 by 1024. You're still a good five or six frames ahead on the 3500, but it sort of narrows a little bit as the resolutions go up. We're expendable, and we're back to that similar pattern where they're pretty close at 800 by 600 just a few frames in it but the gap slowly widens the higher the resolution and up to 1280 by 1024 you're looking at maybe about eight nine frames a second more from the 3500. Of course back in the day people did try and overclock these cards there was all sorts of people tried to add cooling to the fairly inadequate heatsink on the 3000 by strapping all sorts of fans people still continue to do this to this day i don't suppose it's so much for overclocking now in the interest of preservation but people like to keep their voodoos running cool if they can so they last longer and yeah there was a few crazy fans strapped to them that i've seen around on various forums and of course the boxes themselves the uh 
the AGP version of the 3000 didn't really give the game away, giving you the impression of a cooling green colour, but the PCI version perhaps gave the game away with this kind of fiery, <laughs> heat-inducing looking colour that they had on the box. It was interesting when I was looking at this fat Samsung TV tuner that's built onto this card, Back in those days, you know, Samsung were a name, but they weren't the big dominant force that they are now in the sort of TV world. So I'd say a considerable percentage. They were like the market leaders of televisions and in sort of certainly European TVs in people's living rooms, I think. And then suddenly, all of a sudden now, the Chinese companies like TCL are starting to muscle in on that. And it's just a weird change in technology landscape that back then in 1999, China was just celebrating 50 years as a communist country, very militaristic, making really shoddy gear, and nobody would have dreamt in their wildest dreams that they would have usurped companies like Samsung and pretty much everything that's in my modern PC build was probably made in China. Anyway, that was a waffling aside. Just something that cropped into my mind while I was looking at the Samsung TV tuner, thinking how I'd replaced my Samsung TV in my living room with a TCL TV and then thinking about how things have changed in China since 1999 when this card was made. And now they've pretty much probably made everything in my modern gaming rig. But here we're back to the card, putting in this chunky cable and we're going to see if we can mess around with it a little bit. When I first got the card, I thought it had a DVI connector, but it doesn't. It's actually a thing called a P&D connector, which is something slightly non-standard. I don't think it connects directly to any monitors. I may be wrong. So at the minute you have to plug this this um, dongle into the P&D connector and then plug a VGA cable into that. So you've got a kind of almost like a bypass situation going on a bit like you had with the early Voodoos, I guess, but except there aren't two video cards involved. So hopefully there'd be no signal degradation in any way. But you can get P&D adapters, so you don't have to use the dongle. They didn't come out of the box, which is a bit of a shame. Um, so if you get a P&D adapter, you can get them for P&D to VGA, which seems pointless because that wouldn't take advantage of the digital output. But you could use P&D to DVI, which would be the most useful, but they are quite pricey. But I did manage to order a P&D to HDMI, which is on its way from somewhere overseas. So when it gets here, hopefully that will just take away the cumbersome sort of not having this massive cable to deal with. So one of the things you get in the driver is the ability to run a TV, like an actual television, from the output side of the dongle. I guess that would be using the composite cables. There's also an S-video on there if your TV probably wouldn't accept that but you would be able to run composite input into a television and therefore potentially game on a television or watch your tuned in analog tv on a television though personally i can't see the advantages of this because to the best of my knowledge back then most of your tvs would be running at a much lower refresh rate than your monitors and your picture quality would have been generally rubbisher so uh, correct me if you if you know a better use for that so this is a cool thing that basically controls all of the inputs and outputs on the dongle. You can select your source, whether you want the TV tuner or the S-video or the composite inputs. And you can also do things like grab frames and record your TV programs and, and stuff like that. So it's a very cool thing. And um, one of the things that it did come with was a very, very funky skin pack. Um, so you could run through these things there's a skin pack for it as well so you could go in and you can change the skin of it to be honest most of them were a little bit crappy uh, the, the the freely fx one that it comes with out of the box is just so cool the only other one in here that i would say is potentially useful is there was one that was designed for children like very young children in fact as if as if anybody who would use this would be playing with the machine with the 3DFX card in it. I would, wouldn't have thought so, but they did include this almost like a baby style one, which is still quite cute. It's still got a nice 3DFX logo at the bottom, but it hides things like that little orange thing at the top. It took me a while to find it, which is the settings button, so your child couldn't accidentally click on settings and screw up your your system. 
So I was trying to figure out a way to actually use this. And then I thought, you know, running a games console with this might be quite cool. So I have to go through several of my games consoles, try to find one that had composite output out of the box. I found the PlayStation 2 does, which is handy. So we've hooked it up to the dongle on the input side using the cable and at the other end it's hooked in to the PS2 and I think that we should be able to view and do stuff with the output from the PS2 which would be quite cool. So I switched it on, switched the PlayStation 2 on and fired it up and clicked on the source, put it onto the composite and look at that. It's running the intro scene, so that's picking it directly up off the PS2. So how cool is that? And the game is from Westwood as well, of June 2 and Command and Conquer fame, and June 2000, some of my favorite games. This I bought this not because I'm a particular console fan, but I was trying to collect every game that Westwood ever made. And this is the only one they made for a console that I'm aware of. But that project of collecting all of those games quickly came to a halt over a game called, I think it's called Ancient Glory for the Apple II GS. I cannot find that anywhere. And I'm sure when I do, it's going to cost way more than I'm prepared to pay for it. That collection will never be complete. But yeah, look at that. Actually running the PlayStation 2, that, that's as big as it goes, unfortunately. So you wouldn't be able to actually use it to play on. It doesn't seem to scale up in any way. So the other thing it will allow us to do is to capture. So we've captured what we've just played here by pressing the capture button, funnily enough. And look at that. We've got our own little movie recorded. And yeah, that's cool. Of course, the resolution is pretty rubbish. That's as big as it goes when you play it back. But it's just cool to be able to do that, to take, uh, you know, so many people do that these days, capturing their games console gameplay for various reasons, and you could do it back in the day, albeit not to the kind of resolution you'd expect to now, but a file like that would be a good thing if you were making videos to record your console gameplay back in the day. You could well have used a Voodoo 3500 to do it. And that pretty much wraps the video up. It was fun playing with this card, uh, being able to have a little bit of a play with some of the inputs and outputs. It wouldn't be something that I'd want on a daily basis, having that big cable dongle thing hanging out the back of my PC. So if I was ever going to use this, hopefully when I get that adapter, I'll be able to convert the HDMI output back to DVI and be able to play games through it using that without having to get this thing out. But it was fun having a little bit of a play with it just to see get an idea of how it works and how it might have been useful but that was pretty much it it's been a fun card to look at i'm really glad i've got it in my collection i'm really glad i finally got a box with eyes it'll probably be the only one i'll ever splurge out for it wasn't as expensive as they all seem to be now i think it was about 160 pounds or something like that it cost when i got it um but yeah nice to have one nice to have it on the shelf looking down on me and i'm sure i'll get it out and then have a bit of a mess around with it every now and then don't want it just sitting on the shelf gathering dust but that's pretty much it i hope you enjoyed the video taking a look at this card with me i hope you'll join me for the next one and i'll see you later bye